Welcome to the Road to Zero, a future-proof podcast, as we explore the changing nature of our economy as we look for prosperity and opportunity in not only preserving, but also improving our environment. Today on the Road to Zero, we're talking to Kathleen O'Neill, CEO of New Wave Hydrogen Incorporated. Welcome, Kathleen. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you, Nick. It's great to be here. I appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for joining us in from North Carolina. Um, and before we start, could you tell us a little bit about New Wave Hydrogen and what you guys are up to? Sure. Um, it's an early stage technology development company, and we're developing what we call a new energy paradigm in hydrogen production. So it's a method of methane pyrolysis, which heats natural gas to a temperature high enough to directly crack a methane molecule into hydrogen and carbon black. So we get two valuable products. We produce no direct CO2 and we have no water demand. That's pretty, that's quite a, a game changer in this technology, I guess, if, if you know the technology a little bit. We hope so. <laughs> we hope it will be, yes. Yeah. Awesome. And then tell us, how did you get into this field, because I know you've got quite a, a diverse background. So uh, if I read your bio, you have a, a bachelor's in geology, finance, and a master's, and a PhD in uh, environmental engineering sciences. So, right, so uh, right. Yeah. The, the PhD is all but dissertation, so I, uh, I stopped after the qualifying exams. Um, so I can't claim that one, yeah. else, but all of the coursework and, and such. Um, and as you might imagine, in these fields, you feel like you've written 20 dissertations after this many years anyway. So, uh, yeah, it was diverse, um, but really all focused on natural resources um, all the way around. And so my first many years were uh, in uh, consulting, engineering consulting in integrated water resources, um, all different aspects of water resources. And that transitioned into sort of climate-driven impacts and infrastructure decisions um, in resource management and then into water and energy trade-offs. And then over the past 10, 12 years into clean energy technology development. Yeah, and, and right now you're the CEO, not just one, but actually two companies. So we're not gonna talk too much about your other the venture, but you actually even have a CO2 capture company as well that you're, you're, you're developing new technology as well. Yes, that, that one came first. Um, that's the point at which I say I must have lost my mind and, and jumped into this entrepreneurial world. So, uh, so yeah, I've been developing uh, both technologies for, for years. Wow. Okay. And then where, and where does this journey start with this current technology, the new wave hydrogen? So I, I can see there's a lot of activity that started in 2016 and and you've been kind of building up. So where, where did this idea come from and how did you get into that venture? Uh, through the other one, actually. So as you imagine, it's a pretty small world and you develop networks and was working uh, with several groups on the carbon capture technology. And one of them made some introductions to someone else who was looking at this technology. Uh, and I started out just sort of helping them out, not intending to take it on, but very quickly <laughs> it became um, sort of a, you know, a, a, a new interest and a new company. Um, so since 2017 is when we first founded uh, the company. And since then, we've uh, advanced very quickly. It, it's kind of a testament to the global interest in hydrogen over the last few years. Yeah, no, you. It's definitely growing. So, and just to get an idea where your company is at, so you are. Uh, there's been like nine or ten million dollars of financing that you've managed to put together, and now you're you're starting field tests. Is that correct? Yes, we um, have I've been working with major um, oil and energy companies for several years in um, smaller contracts uh, to prove out the technology. So we've done full modeling and um, uh, techno-economic analyses and uh, more detailed designs of different applications. And then this past summer, we uh, hit a milestone and we were working with the University of Florida uh, and they helped us customize a shock tube 
uh, they have these big, long shock tubes in their in their laboratories. Um, and so we, we modified it to uh, simulate the wave dynamics that occur in a single channel in our technology. And we were able to definitively demonstrate methane paralysis via compression energy or shock wave energy in the shock tube this summer. Okay. And then and there was really a, a, a lot on your technology and it's a, there's definitely technical stuff and it looks like this is stuff that was somewhat developed back in the 40s or, or, or 20s for something else that you're adapting. And yes, that, yeah, that's the fun part. This is decades old. Um, both parts, there's two core components to the technology. One is called a wave rotor. And the other is methane paralysis, the process itself. And both of them have decades and reams and reams of literature uh, associated with them and studies and tests and commercial um, applications, actually. So uh, wave rotors um, have been used uh, as sort of pressure gain enhancers or um, efficiency enhancers in engines and in uh, some, there's research in turbines and we actually have a patent looking at using our system uh, for uh, efficiency enhancement in integration with uh, energy generation power turbines. But in any case, there are many uses for uh, wave rotors and another one is um, gas heating. So uh, they're known to yeah. heat gases to very high temperatures. Yeah, and then from what I gathered, like you basically have a drum that spins and then you have gases coming into it. And as it spins, it, it you know, it basically opens up or closes to different pressures and that creates a bit of a wave action. And that's what causes the heating, is that correct? That's right, exactly. Um, we, if you consider um, a shock tube or even just a tube, and many tubes arrayed around the circumference of a drum. So you have all these tubes around the circumference and you have ports on the end. So the drum's rotating. And when a port in the end plates has an opening and the end of the, the uh, channel aligns with that opening, then you have sort of like a valve that opens. And when that end plate closes, it closes that channel. So if you introduce a pressurized gas and close that channel, it hits the wall. And if it's a high pressure gas, it's then in a contained space and it bounces off the wall. It causes a hammer shock or a reflective shock and causes a series of wave dynamics that, are, uh, that create a shock wave, essentially, a supersonic speeding wave <laughs> of gases. So what we're able to do is um, instead of using electricity or to drive, say, a plasma source or another energy source to heat the gas, we use very little electricity. We actually use the pressure that's in, already entrained in a pressurized natural gas pipeline. So that, that pressure drop, if you will, as it enters the channel and then hits the end wall, uh, sets up that series of waves so we don't need an electrical driver. And that enclosed channel creates the compression that allows the transfer of energy from one gas to the next and it acts as a temperature amplifier okay and then and what happens is that you have a couple of things you have the pressure and then you have this this wave action and then and then basically your your in, in your your natural gas or methane then just separates into its components of carbon and, and hydrogen Yes, it directly crack. It reaches a temperature. I'm sorry, my cat is getting right in the middle. <laughs> I always do that. Um, reaches a temperature where it directly cracks the methane molecule. So methane is CH4, and it cracks it into its constituents, carbon and hydrogen. Yeah, and then and what does that carbon look like? So it's not CO2. It's not a gas. It's an actual like physical carbon that comes out. Exactly. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's it's solid. It's a, it's we believe it will be carbon black, which is a pretty high quality, um, valuable product. Okay. And what what can you do with carbon black? Uh, there's a whole industry where uh, they use it in fillers, uh, in pigments, uh, for fillers for tires, for rubber products, in pigments for plastics, and all sorts of other you know niche uses. Okay, so you we, end up with a, a byproduct you can actually sell. Yes, yes. 
exactly. Um, and we also have uh, in our proposed work over the next two years, we have um, over a year of carbon R&D. So we'll be looking at different other uses for that carbon. So there's a lot of research in high value carbon products like carbon fiber, nanocarbons, things along those lines. Um, and one area that I'd like to look at as well is the potential to um, either use it as is or change it to activated carbon to be able to use it in contaminant removal in a big watershed scale um, or field scale where it's both removing contaminants from the air, potentially more CO2, and also contaminants from the water, any organic or inorganic contaminants that would absorb from the carbon in it. In a wow. So, yeah, so tr a true example of the circular economy. So you end up with actually two valuable products, uh, not just one. Right. And then not to forget the hydrogen, which is the clean burning fuel that we have to provide. Right. Yeah. And, and the interesting part, because I read some of the, the information you had. So, so literally this process uses less electricity than what we call green hydrogen, you know, solar hydrogen to create and, and virtually no CO2. Yes. Yes. It's, it's really not widely known that electrolysis uh, uses a tremendous amount of electricity. So not only do you need a huge build out in renewables for electrolysis to be green, um, it also will itself demand a large fraction of that renewable base that you have to build out. Um, so it's an interesting dilemma associated with electrolysis. Um, it's a it's fabulous concept, um, but there are some, some drawbacks in implementation. Yeah. So... So you've got a bit of a game changer technology on your hands where, uh, you know, any kind of fossil fuel companies can take all this natural gas and turn it into uh, carbon free hydrogen fairly cheaply. Right. Exactly. We can decarbonize fuel, decarbonize hydrogen feedstocks, um, pretty much any end use. Wow. And then just give us an idea of when we'll actually see that. So right now you're, you're doing a lot of field testing and, and what's your timelines as to when you'll actually have an, a, a working plant to test because I, I see there's there's multiple test pieces. Have you actually built a unit ready to test or is that coming down the, uh, the future? We have built a single channel unit um, where uh, wherein we can demo, you will use the first set of testing in this two year program using that single channel unit um, and then very quickly um, use what we learn to in that and in some 2D and 3D C, CFD uh, computational fluid dynamic models that we're doing um, to create the multi-channel unit um, and then move into an integrated field pilot. So some of our co-funding partners are, are major global oil and energy companies and natural gas distribution companies, quite a few of them. Um, and they're interested in potentially hosting the field pilot. So we would work, we are working with them to identify a site and design where we'll actually install it in a controlled um, way in one of their um, on-site systems in order to do a field demonstration or a field pilot. And this should be yeah. in 2022, just okay. next year. Just next year, okay. And I can see why there'd be a lot of interest from those companies. It really gives them a, a, a very quick, cheap solution to really provide some of the lowest carbon hydrogen around. Exactly, right. It, in fact, all of them are... Uh, with a, it seems to be a buzzword these years, pivoting <laughs> to uh, to their their markets. They have put a tremendous amount of investment in R and D in um, in clean energy and particularly in hydrogen. So they're all looking to the future. Yeah. Okay. So twenty two. So when do you see this this uh, technology come into the market? Um, that's hard to say, but I, I would love to. It's really, there are multiple end uses in multiple markets. So after this field pilot, this field pilot might be relatively simple where we are, we say that nothing simple, but where we're ad mixing, <laughs> creating a fraction of hydrogen to add mix in an existing natural gas pipeline. So it's creating a lower carbon fuel for delivery. That's one application. And another application is full on pure hydrogen development, say for a fuel fueling station. Um, for a fuel cell electric vehicle type um, uh, program. So that would be ideally our next field pilot. And 
when that transportation field pilot goes online, I'd like to simultaneously have the admixing one move to a commercial pilot stage and then sequentially move them into the market. So 2025 would be very optimistic <laughs> okay. projection. Well, that's good. And, and it's nice what you say, because there's a couple of places I, I hear you can basically have this at the, you know, at the wellhead if you want to uh, you know make the hydrogen out of the ground or at the other end of the pipeline in the city somewhere and then then you connect your fueling stations to that so it's really interesting how it's a, a really versatile technology that way yeah it, it really is it's scalable which is it's uniquely scalable really um and uh, maintains its cost efficiency at both small and large scales which is unlike the, the current technology of steam methane reforming, um, which uses a, uses a lot of water actually, and a water shift reaction and creates CO2. So that, that's the issue with the current technology, although it's a, it's a well-established technology for hydrogen production. Um, so they have matched the steam methane reforming, which they call SMR, with carbon capture and sequestration. And that works in some areas where you actually have CO2 pipelines and uh, a whole CCS uh, storage facility already permitted and built and with monitoring verification, everything set up. But those places are rare. They're few and far between, and it's extremely expensive to set up. So for, for SMR with CCS to be implemented on a really large regional scale and globally, it's going to be decades. And may not happen at all because CCS is a is a complicated system to to implement in some areas. Yeah, yeah, carbon capture it's yeah, it's really interesting. It really depends on geology where like where can you actually put the carbon and and it takes a bit of work. That's where you've you've created a bit of an interesting shortcut for the industry where you don't have to worry about all that and at a fraction of the cost. So it's right. It's a, much lower risk. Much lower risk. Yeah. yeah, for the public as well, for both the public and the industry, it's much lower risk. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And then where, where are your personal thoughts of where you see this, this hydrogen economy? Because like you said, it, there's been a lot of interest and it seems to be growing quite a, quite a exponentially over the last couple of years. And, and what you see is what's really driving this innovation in hydrogen and where do you see it going in the near and long term? Um, I, I've seen a change in just, probably you have too, in just the last year, year and a half. It, the, the, just globally, it has boomed. The, the um, interest and investment in hydrogen and the transition to a hydrogen economy is really at the forefront of every energy company's um, prospectus. So, and it certainly wasn't that way a couple of years ago. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting, it has increased over the past five years, but I think the last year and a half is just the pivotal change. So I, d I don't see that stopping anytime soon. Um, I think it will continue as a really viable, important trend. Yeah, and I'm sure I'm sure you've been happy to see where it's been going over the last year because that definitely puts you uh, in charge of a pretty valuable commodity. Yeah, yeah, that wasn't really, you know, the whole intent, but it's fabulous. I certainly can't complain about that. <laughs> we just have to make it work now. That's the hard part. <laughs> yeah, and, and I imagine you probably got a lot more attention over the last year than you've had before. Um, yes, we're really a low-profile company, so uh, perhaps not as much attention as many other companies. So I, I don't go out and do any new – Very. this is probably the first – real interview I've done, aside from a couple of articles. Um, I've given technical talks, but, you know, they're really limited audiences. So we've kept it pretty, not on purpose, but just by default, pretty low profile. Yeah. Um, but I hope that changes as well over the next few years as we grow. Yeah, and no, I manage it well. And, and thank you for, uh, yeah, allowing us to, to have the privilege of uh, uh, bring the story out because it is a very, um, very promising story, by, for sure. Thank you. It's exciting. It really is. It's yeah. fun. Yeah. And anything? Um, what? What is? Sounds like you. You've got some good funding. Sounds like you've got some good partners. What? What are you looking for to uh, further what you're up to? Are you pretty well set up at this point? Oh no, we all, everybody always needs to you know. There's always more to do. Um, it's never never done. Um, so uh, 
uh, we would like, I guess, essentially, uh, as we were just saying, a little more exposure, both in, uh, in various continents and globally. Um, we are working with, as I said, major oil and energy companies right now. Um, the N Canada's NGIF is the Natural Gas Innovation Fund, and it is formed of um, pretty much all of the major natural gas producers and distributors in Canada. And I think we have 10 of the 12 or 13 members um, on our project. So they have directly contributed to our technology. So we have access to them, which is fabulous. Um, so I would like to continue that and get to know them better and their needs and actually start working on strategic roadmaps and market adoption strategies with them. Um, the same with their counterparts um, in other parts of the world. Uh, most of those are global companies. So we're working in some cases with a Canadian um, division and we'd like to spread that out to the rest of their, their companies. We're also working with Total um, out of their headquarters in France, but they're clearly also a very global company and they're looking at market adoption in multiple, um, multiple areas within their um, services around the world. Uh, we're working with GRT Gas, which is a major um, natural gas distributor in Europe. Um, and uh, many of the government agencies in Canada that are supporting clean energy. So to, I would like to branch that out into the US actually, um, and to other parts of Europe, Asia, and so on. Yeah, so I hear your, your future will get more and more busy as we go along. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. we, need, we need to grow a bit, yep. yeah. Um, it sounds like you've got uh, yeah all the ingredients, and I'm, I'm sure you'll have a very successful future. And I'm really looking forward to see how how quickly this gets adopted. Because I think once the secret gets out, you'll have a lot of interest. We hope so. Thank you. It's very kind of you. Awesome. Well, thank you for being my guest today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, yeah, and then we'll see you at the showcase on March 17. Okay, great. I'm looking forward to it. I am. Thank you. And have a good day. You too. To hear more about our podcasts, showcase events, or on the Future Proof Network, please visit us at www.futureproof-network.com.